The history of the Israeli army is something of an armor enthusiast's dream. They seem to have used pretty much everything from everywhere to include captured equipment pressed into service. Their willingness to use whatever they can is probably best typified by the service careers of the M4 Sherman, which saw many upgrades over the course of their lives. Now, this particular M50 is one with which I am well familiar from its time at the MVTF in California. It can now be found under the care of the staff at Battlefield Vegas, who have been nice enough to allow me to clamber over it for a little bit in the cool weather of early July in Southern Nevada. This is going to be a long intro, because nothing about Israeli Shermans is simple. Now, famously, of course, they started off with scrounging Shermans and guns from wherever they could, scrapyards, reserve pools, and so on, in order to survive the War of Independence. But by 1951, they were in a position to take a slightly more standardized approach to things. So a Captain Hillel Munin was sent to France to do some bulk shopping. The French, of course, were well equipped with a wide variety of Shermans, which were procured during and after the war, and they were more than willing to sell a batch of 75mm tanks, which by this point were somewhat beyond their use-by date by Western European standards. The Israelis weren't picky. The French had their own Sherman problem at the time as well. They had a wide variety of Sherman types from a wide variety of sources, and they were something of a logistical nightmare. They decided that they wanted to standardize everything on one engine type. Since they had more Continentals than anything else, they decided that all the other Shermans that they had would be re-engined with the R975. So they opened them up, took out whatever the old engine was, modified the engine deck, dropped the Continental radial in, and they redesignated these vehicles as a Transformé, which basically had a little T at the end of it. So you had an M4A2T, an M4A3T. So it's an A2 or an A3 in American service. It's the engine is a difference. In French service, they all have a Continental. When these were shipped off to Israel, by this point, they're all such a hodgepodge, they defy conventional nomenclature. The Israelis simply called it the M3, after the 75mm gun M3 with which they were all armed. Pretty soon, though, it was obvious that some upgunning would be required. So back to France, they went again for more shopping, France being one of the few countries willing to openly sell arms to Israel at the time. Two purchases were made. One was for a batch of 76mm armed tanks. These were known in Israeli service as the M1. Again, it's the 76mm gun M1. Or it was the M1 Super Sherman if it had the horizontal volume suspension system. The other purchase they made, though, was for a new tank entirely, and this turned out to be the AMX-13 with the 75mm gun. Now, the Israelis very much liked the gun, but they were a little bit ambivalent about the tank upon which it was to be found. So, a small order of AMX-13s was placed, and in the meantime, they set about doing experiments to see could you fit this AMX gun into the M3 Sherman turret. It turned out that yes, you could. And so a conversion program was started. About 25 of these tanks were delivered to Israel in time for the 1956 war. In keeping with the trend, again, they were named after the gun which was mounted on the Sherman, in this case, the M50. The Israelis weren't done yet, though. By the early 1960s, Continentals were starting to get a bit long in the truth and troublesome. So another upgrade program was started, this time to the hulls. The engines were replaced by a Cummins diesel. If the tank still had the vertical volume suspension, it was replaced with horizontal volume. New fuel tanks were installed, new electrical systems, so on. The entire rebuild process basically stripped the hull all the way down to bare bones. When the Israelis were starting to put these things back together, though, they weren't really all that pushed about putting the same pieces back onto the same tanks that they came off of in the first place. It was just whatever was handy on the assembly line. So you could end up maybe with a late production hull, with a mid production turret, with a three piece differential housing and horizontal valued suspension. There's really no such thing as a standard M50. And this vehicle is no exception. So I'm going to get into some of the quirks as we go around it. So that was the long introduction complete. Now it's time to look at the tank. 
So what we have here is a small hatch Sherman, complete with additional armor plate in front of the bulges for the driver and bog, because of course those bulges are nearly vertical and it's a little bit of a weak spot. I do note how the mounting point for the canvas, the dust shield, does actually merge onto the new replacement plate. The armor plate itself is the old two inches, sloped at 58, and then we come down to the differential housing. As you can see, this is a late production differential housing, the shark nose, but the vehicle itself was originally built with a three-piece differential housing, and I'll explain later how we know this. Another thing I will explain later is this 016, which further complicates this vehicle's history. Other items, so what we have here is a mounting point for the tow cable. So what will normally happen is the tow cable would be stretched front to rear with one end mounted in here and the other end mounted aft. These two attachment points here are being used in the traditional manner. You'll see a lot of photographs of M50s with, in fairness, a bit more concertina wire than here, but hey, safety, we're not in wartime. And you simply drape the concertina wire up top and you clip it into place down here. Otherwise, it's pretty much a standard Sherman. So your lights are behind the bush guards. There was a replacement siren mounted here. So not the World War II siren, there's a later one in a sort of a tunnel shroud. It has since been deleted. Your standard towing shackle mounts at the bottom of the differential housing also can be used for lifting said differential housing, of course, because you simply undo the bolts here. And that's it. It's pretty much a standard Sherman. And of course, on the turret front, you're going to see the other really noticeable difference from the front, which of course is the gun and mounting. Now remember, this is an original small 75 millimeter turret and they're sticking a not unsizable gun into it. So in order to avoid ending up with like firefly levels of crampedness, what the Israelis did was they added a protruding mantlet. Actually, the French did because this was developed in France. Uh, the original vehicle that was used for the test project is still in some more although it has been converted back to uh, the earlier configuration. Anyway, back to the mantlet. I do this sometimes, I go off on tangents. What looks like a, an additional cast mounting isn't actually welded onto the turret front or anything like that. It's bolted on in exactly the same manner as the original mantlet would have been. You just can't see it behind the weather striping. But the end result of it, you can see the pivot point is nearly a foot in front of where it would be on a regular M3 Sherman. As we come around to the side of the tank, this is how we can tell that it was originally built with a three-piece differential housing. Look at the gap between the road wheels, between the bogies on the HVSS system. This marks the hull as having been built as an M4A4, the extended version with the Chrysler multibank engine. All M4A4s were built with the three-piece housing. This means then that this particular tank has started with the Chrysler engine, moved to the Continental engine, and now has the Cummins engine, as well as having had the suspension units replaced from VVSS to HVSS. Since the suspension is wider, they added additional sand shields, which are wider, and that also provides opportunity for a little bit of stowage on the side. So we got three jerry cans, set of trap rocks, sponson box here. This is the exhaust for the auxiliary generator, two road wheels at the back. Now, if you look up, you're going to see the French designed smoke dischargers or smoke grenade launchers. And further back is the counterweight that was added to balance out the length of the gun on the front. Now, all the M50s were made from different size or different types of Sherman turrets. So you had a high bustle turret or a low bustle turret, didn't matter, the process was the same. You cut off most of the bustle, you leave a little shelf at the bottom, provides a little extra support, and then you add the counterweight on top of that. So this particular vehicle was a high bustle, uh, high bustle turret. So as the first of the HVSS Shermans that we've come to, now it's a good time to take a little look at the suspension. The HVSS bogies are bolted onto the side just like the predecessors were, which probably made the upgrade process a lot easier. The primary difference, of course, between the suspension types is the volute springs. These two things here are now mounted 90 degrees off from previously the horizontal instead of vertical, which is not really surprising given the names horizontal and vertical value suspension systems. Just above you got a shock absorber and the two pairs now of road wheels, because we have wider track, we now have four road wheels per bogey instead of the earlier two. 
have a little bit more range of motion, giving you that smoother ride for which the E8 suspension system was famous. Another obvious difference is the return rollers are now bolted directly to the hull sides instead of being mounted as part of the bogey, where the return roller and skid would otherwise go. You see instead here now is the shock absorber. An interesting little feature just pointed out to me is on the bottom of the hull, right in the corner where it meets the floor, behind the inside wheels, they have shaved out a little bit of the hull armor. And the reason they did this was just to make it a little bit easier to change the inside road wheel when you need to. So it gives you just a little bit more room as you're pulling it off of the hub. The track is the late type, of course, 23 inches wide, six inch pitch, Typical construction with end connectors, wedge bolts, occasional cooling tubes. If you see a hole, that's because it's a cooling tube. There are 83 blocks per side. Now, this is the long haul version. If it was a shorter hull, let's say it was originally based off of an M4A3 or an M4A1, you'd be looking at 79 blocks per side. Israeli Shermans generally came with steel cleat tracks. This is obviously a rubber Chevron track and well, this is a post-war thing usually for collectors and so on. It just makes life a lot easier when you're driving on the roads and the Department of Transportation doesn't come after you. The rear hull is something which would be interesting if it wasn't for the fact that a large exhaust deflector is located here. Now, the real exhaust deflector is a hinge to allow you extra access to whatever you need to, but they're a little bit hard to come by these days for restoration. So this is a fixed one in place and requires lots of unbolting. And I'm not going to ask the lads here to do this in the middle of July. If you were to look behind and hopefully we'll have an inset of this particular vehicle before the exhaust deflector was added, you're going to see the swing doors from the original engine access for the Continental, complete with a little hole for the hand crank. On the left hand side will be a blanked off circular panel, about yay big, and that was the original location of the exhaust for the Cummins. Track tension is done in the typical Sherman track tension manner. I've done it in other Sherman videos. If you really are all that interested, and I don't blame you for it, but if you are, go find one of the other Sherman videos I've done and you can get to have a look at the track tension system there. If you look under the hull, you can also see the support. So the, the bogey on the side is bolted to the side. It's also a little underfloor support as well, just to help take the weight of the vehicle. Otherwise, it's basically stowage. The Israelis love putting stowage on their vehicles. I'm perfectly happy with this because I firmly believe that your own gear is better on your own tank. Yes, it can be a problem if somebody machine guns your tank, and that means that it machine guns your gear. But on the other hand, you're not wondering, oh, where is First Sergeant with my sleeping bag? And it just makes life so much simpler. So that's it for the back. Next stop is the engine deck. The engine deck, of course, is a complete reconfiguration. So if you recall, your typical Continental engine deck has a long panel just behind the turret with uh, an angled air vent on it and raised barriers around the outside. Well, of course, once they replace the Continental with the Cummins, the internal configuration is completely different and this panel no longer works. So all they did was they took that long panel, cut it right down the middle, took the two halves and rotated them 90 degrees. So what you're looking at here are the original, basically M4A1 type uh, engine deck cover. But because it's a slightly different shape, it wasn't a, a perfect rectangle as it were, they've had to add a four inch spacer here just to fill in the gap. Other items on the engine deck. On the far corner, you're going to see the other latching point for the tow cable. And you'll only see the M50s in Israeli service with one tow cable per vehicle, which Maybe a little bit odd because usually these days we're used to two. But if you think about it, it's not really necessary to have two because all you happen is if you're recovering a tank with another tank by tow cable, you already have two tanks there and each one has one tow cable. So you have two tow cables available to tow your tank. Very simple. Gun travel lock is obviously located here. Big one that they had to move because of the length of the gun. Otherwise, the original travel lock, of course, on the Sherman was on the front. The exhaust was relocated in the 70s from that earlier position down below to up here. The Israelis love welding numbers and lettering or whatever onto things just in case paint scrapes off. So on a lot of the fuel ports, for example, you see Hebrew lettering. Uh, th this one doesn't behind me, but the one over there may have. And it just says what is underneath 
to keep it simple for the uh, fuelers or whoever is uh, putting fluids in to make sure you put, don't put the wrong fluid into the wrong hatch. Otherwise, underneath here is the VT8460. It's the last of a long line of common V8 engines, starting with the uh, V8380. And what well, it's basically in the name. So VT8 means it's a V8 turbocharged. 460 is the horsepower. And the only real difference between the 460 and the 430 is a higher pressure system. Uh, which also meant, though, that you had huge clouds of smoke coming out of this thing, really obvious, and the reliability probably wasn't what it should have been. So the last thing to do is open up the panel and have a quick look inside. The first thing you're going to see is a very, very large yellow air filter canister. There is one on the other side as well. Then further down below, you're going to see a large yellow engine, and actually a fair bit of space otherwise. This brings us now to an end of part one. And of course, part two is when we go around to various crew positions. It'll come out in a couple of weeks. So in the meantime, while you're waiting, use the link down below if you're not already playing World of Tanks, and it'll give you something to do while you're biting your nails, wondering what the inside of the tank looks like. So until then, from Southern Nevada and the lads of Battlefield Vegas, take care, I'll talk to you then. And you'll also notice something, ah, uh, Woohoo! All right.